Nice. Uh, today's reading is Mark 15, uh, 1 to 15, and then 33 to 39. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sandrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release you to you, the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to get Pilate to release Bar Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked him. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima shabachthachni, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Cameron. Evening, everyone. Lovely to see you. I'm Emma Hayward, and I'm a member of the congregation here. The title for this sermon is Christ Crucified, and it's part of our sermon series based on the Apostles' Creed that we read together earlier. And today we've arrived at the section that says that Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. And I have to tell you that I am bursting with excitement to be preaching on Christ crucified. The more I've read about it, the more excited I've become. At one point, I couldn't actually put into words the message that I wanted to bring to you um, because I was so excited about it. And that was a bit of a problem because sermons do tend to depend on words rather than me just bouncing around in front of you all excited. But praise God, he helped me over that hurdle and we've got a few words this morning and this evening. So why am I so excited about this topic of Christ crucified? I mean, if you think about it, going around telling people that the hero of the story dies sounds more like a disappointment or even a disaster and not something to get excited about. And to many people, it just doesn't make sense. How can the death of a man 2,000 years ago have any effect on our lives now? In 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness, absurd and illogical to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the manifestation of the power of God. The cross is the manifestation of the power of God. And that's why I'm excited about it. Because what looked like the greatest defeat in the history of mankind turned out to be the greatest victory the world had ever seen. And we know that because we know how the story ends. And that is in some ways a bit of a problem because 
Knowing that death wasn't the end and that Jesus rose again from the dead can mean that we're tempted to skip over the part of the story that Cameron just read for us. And it can lose some of its significance. So we're going to walk through this passage and try to see it through the eyes of those present at the time who didn't know how things were going to play out. Then we're going to look at this event in the context of the whole of the Bible and then see how it applies to our lives. So let's try to look at this passage as if we were there at the time. If you read through the whole thing and the chapters beforehand, you'll see there are many themes that we are familiar with. Political maneuvering, envy, power, a miscarriage of justice, a guilty man getting away with murder, and an innocent man convicted. It's really similar, isn't it, to the environment we're in. National events influenced by political and personal agendas, unfairness and injustice. People in positions of authority not being held to account. Today's reading plunges, plunges us straight into drama and political intrigue. And human history is peppered with these moments where significant things occur rapidly and cause a major change in the direction of a nation. The announcement of lockdown, the surprise resignation of a prime minister, the moment the first tanks roll across a border to invade another country. Events like these can cause us to wonder where God is and what he's doing. Jesus' conviction and execution would have been just as bewildering for the people living at the time as the outbreak of COVID was for us. If you look at the beginning of our reading, it's very early in the morning. The previous night, Jesus had been betrayed by Judas Iscariot to the Jewish religious leaders. They had him arrested, tried in a religious court, and beaten. Now they're meeting to plan their next step because they don't seem to actually have a plan, just a desire to get rid of Jesus, who'd been calling out their hypocrisy and disrupting their way of doing things. This doesn't seem to be a calm and ordered situation. It actually seems to be quite chaotic. Jesus is bound and dragged before Pilate, the Roman governor. The leading priests haven't even agreed on the crime they're accusing him of. So they throw all sorts at him. Tax evasion, claiming to be a king, leading a revolt. And Pilate is perplexed. None of the accusations stand up. And he can't understand why Jesus is not protesting his innocence. In the end, Pilate gives up and asks the crowd what they want him to do. To his surprise, they start calling for the release of Barabbas, a convicted murderer, presumably the man destined to occupy the third cross on Calvary later that day. But if I release Barabbas... Pilate asked them, what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, crucify him, crucify him. So Jesus takes the place of a murderer, the innocent substituted for the guilty. Jesus is flogged while Barabbas walks free. Just think for a moment about something you might be afraid of perhaps an exam or a visit to the dentist, having a difficult conversation with someone. Imagine if someone could legitimately take your place and do that difficult thing for you, how relieved you would feel. So imagine Barabbas' astonishment, a condemned man saved at the last minute by Jesus, who willingly bears his cross and goes to die in his place. A couple of days later, Barabbas would have heard about Jesus coming back from the dead and perhaps realized that what Jesus did has a significance beyond just saving his life. Was he among the people who over the next few weeks would recognize that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world in order to offer people eternal life and restored relationship with God? I wonder what his reaction was. Did he go back to his old rebellious ways? Or was he forever changed by Jesus' offer of a second chance? 
That's a choice we all have to make. So that's Barabbas. But what about Jesus' disciples and the bystanders who witnessed the trial? I don't know how many of you have seen the dramatization of the Post Office Horizon scandal. It tells the story of hundreds of post office workers who were falsely accused of stealing money from their own post offices. What looked like the theft of thousands of pounds was actually a fault with the computer system. But these unfortunate people were accused and taken to court. They felt that surely justice would prevail, that someone would see that they'd done nothing wrong. So imagine their sense of confusion and shock and outrage when they were found guilty. Perhaps Jesus' followers felt the same. He'd done nothing wrong. Surely it wouldn't be possible for Pilate to get, let the priests get their way. But then he was not only convicted, but sentenced to death the very same day. His followers had believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the one promised by God to save them. But now he hangs naked and humiliated on a cross. Their confusion is evident. In verse 34, when Jesus calls out to God, they think he's calling for the prophet Elijah. Maybe he'll come and take him down. But no. Instead, we read in some of the other Gospels that Jesus said, it is finished. And it must have seemed like that to Jesus' disciples. Everything they thought they knew came crumbling down. Finished. Defeated. Or at least, that's how it seemed. But now we need to zoom out and look at this story from another perspective. Because the chaos and confusion we've seen in this story is not just a result of bad decision-making, politics, or things just getting out of hand. It's all part of the ongoing struggle between good and evil, God and Satan. Right back at the very beginning of time, God created everything, including angels. Angels are moral beings, intelligent, but without physical bodies. Angels are worshippers of God and are sent by him to convey messages and to do his will. Satan was once an angel like this, but seems to have sinned by attempting to become equal to God. As a consequence, Satan and the other fallen angels, known as demons, lost the privilege of serving God and were removed from his presence. Satan was the originator of sin. He sinned before appearing in the Garden of Eden to tempt Adam and Eve. Satan and demons are hostile opponents of God who oppose and try to destroy every good work of his. Satan's mission is to blind people to the good news, to cause people to turn away from God and to destroy themselves. His ways lead to death. If he can keep a person away from God until they die and are permanently excluded from God's presence, then Satan has succeeded. His tactics include lies and deception, temptation, doubt, guilt, fear, confusion, disguise, sickness, envy, pride, and slander. In his book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis imagines conversations between demons as they try to keep a man away from God. One demon writes, It doesn't matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than gambling if gambling will do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. In 1 Peter 5.8, Peter writes, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Now, we shouldn't spend too much time worrying about Satan, but we should remain aware of his activity in the world. But we must also remember that Satan is a created being and he's limited by God's control. 
Satan and his demons cannot know the future and they cannot read our thoughts. Since rebelling against God, Satan's power is weakening because sin is a weakening and destructive influence. However, we can see that Satan was at work in this story that we're looking at today. In John 13, we read that Satan entered into Judas Iscariot when he went to betray Jesus. We can see his tactics in the envy of the priests and in stirring up an angry mob calling for his death. Satan knew that the result of sin is death and permanent separation from God. Since Adam and Eve listened to Satan's lies and turned their back on God, that has been the destiny for anyone who's not made right with God. When Satan saw Jesus nailed to the cross, it must have seemed to Satan that he had won. He'd succeeded in causing the death of God's own son. But he had no idea what was going to happen next. Because what looked like the greatest defeat in history is the greatest victory the world has ever seen. Because when Jesus cried out, it is finished, everything changed. It is finished comes from the Greek word tetelestai. This word is found on ancient receipts and it means paid in full. Moments later, when Jesus breathed his last, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Hebrews chapters 9 and 10 describes why this was so significant as the author describes the difference between the old covenant, that's how God related to people before Jesus, and the new covenant, how people can relate to God because of Jesus. I can't read the whole of Hebrews 9 and 10 to you. You can read it at home, but I will summarize for you. In the old covenant, there were regulations for worship and a sacred tent or temple here on earth. There were two rooms in this tent. You can see them in the model built by the children at Wave. The first room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain, and behind the curtain was a second room called the most holy place. Only the high priest goes into the most holy place and only once a year and always with blood, which he offers to God to cover his own sins and the sins the people have committed. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the most holy place was not open to the people as long as the first room and the entire system it represented were still in use. The gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. The old system in the law was only a shadow of the things to come, not the reality of the good things that Christ has done for us. Under the old covenant, the priest stands by, before the altar day after day, offering sacrifices that can never take away sins. But our high priest, Jesus offered himself to God as one sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Tetelestai, paid in full. When Jesus died, the curtain that separated people from the presence of God was torn from top to bottom. That curtain was 18 meters high, so just a bit taller than this room. So for it to be torn from top to bottom was a supernatural act demonstrating that God was making a way for people to enter his presence, the most holy place. In Colossians 2, it says, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. He canceled the record that contained the charges against us. He took it and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. The wages of sin is death. That's why the priests had to enter the most holy place with sacrifices. But Jesus, who had never sinned, paid the penalty for us all on the cross once and for all time. But because he'd never sinned, death could not hold on to him. And his resurrection is the proof of that. What looked like the greatest defeat in history is the greatest victory the world has ever seen. Because through Jesus' death and resurrection, anyone who believes and trusts in Jesus can be set free now, put right with God, and receive eternal life. If you're here today and you're still stuck in sin, 
you've made some bad choices or you need rescuing from a situation you can't get yourself out of, the good news is that Jesus came to set you free, to make you truly alive. We all sin. None of us can win at life. None of us can reach the perfect standard that God sets. We all need a saviour, someone who can put us right with God. All you're asked to do is to admit that Jesus suffered and died in your place, that he took your cross, just like he took the cross for Barabbas. We say sorry for the things that we've done wrong that meant he had to pay that price for us. We say thank you and let him know that we want him to be our rescuer. Accepting Jesus as your rescuer means that you'll never be separated from God, not now and not after death. You will always have access to him and he will always be with you. That curtain is torn from top to bottom permanently. And this is really, really good news. But there's more. On the cross, Jesus did not just die for our sin, but to show once and for all that he is victorious in the battle between good and evil, God and Satan. Yes, the fight is still ongoing, but the outcome is certain. Even before the resurrection, the result was assured. It's a bit like finishing writing at the end of an exam. Once you finish writing, your grade is already guaranteed. Results day is just the public declaration of what's already been done in the exam hall. Jesus' resurrection was the public declaration of his victory and proof that those who trust in him will also receive eternal life. This is a good bit. Colossians 2.15, it says, On the cross, he disarmed the evil rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross of Christ. The cross marks the decisive defeat of Satan and all demonic powers. The cross was a public demonstration of the failure of those demonic powers to stop God's plan of salvation through Christ. That's why I'm so excited to preach Christ crucified. Satan has been robbed of his power. Any power he might have had, he's disarmed and he's defeated. And this has real life implications for us. The work of Christ on the cross is the ultimate basis for our authority over demons. Our sins are completely forgiven, so Satan can't accuse us before God. We don't need to allow Satan any influence, and we can resist temptation with the help of the Holy Spirit. Have you heard Satan the accuser telling you lies about your identity, your value, or your destiny? You don't have to listen. Resist the devil, Scripture says, and he will flee from you. You can literally say that when faced with temptation. I'm resisting the devil, so therefore he must flee from me. Try it. It works. We're now God's children. So if Satan attacks us, he's attacking one of God's own family. We've been given spiritual weapons and the ability to destroy strongholds through prayer. Have you come across seemingly impossible situations in your family, your work, or in your country? In prayer, we've got the weapons to take down strongholds, so put on your spiritual armor and fight. Or are you living with the fear of death or of evil? You don't need to. He who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. We don't need to fear demons, and we should expect the gospel to come in power to triumph over the works of the devil. He's disarmed, and he is defeated. Are you expecting to see that as you share the good news with people? We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to some and foolishness to many, but to those whom God has called the power of God and the greatest victory of all time.